Hello and welcome to Kind of Man TV. My name is Conor McLeod and in this exclusive interview I get the chance to chat with Jeff Ditchfield. Jeff is a well-known cannabis activist who has been charged on several occasions as a direct result of standing up for those that require medicinal cannabis. In 2002, Jeff founded Bud Buddies, a non-profit organisation that has distributed medicinal cannabis free of charge to those in desperate need of medicine, but due to unethical and ignorant UK laws have been unable to receive their medicine through official channels. Jeff is also the author of the Medical Cannabis Guidebook, which provides an all-inclusive source for anyone who would like to understand the basis of cannabinoid medicine and become self-sustainable in producing their own. So, make sure to like and subscribe, and stick around until the end, so you don't miss out on the end of the episode cartoon. Now then, let's talk cannabis. Thanks very much, Jeff, for agreeing. This is brilliant. No worries. I was going to say, do you want me to move my camera or anything, or is it...? No, that, that looks perfect. That really does look... That looks brilliant. Um, yeah, so... so Sorry, so, I've got to say, yeah, behind me, that's the seat. That's where the... So, that's the seat at the bottom of my garden. Yeah, that's lucky. I think I've got a wooden fence. That's about as exotic as you're looking at. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, this is... Uh, this is brilliant, Jeff. What I was going to say is for the viewers that are unaware, um, Jeff lives in Jamaica, so uh, I'm in Scotland here. It's two o'clock in the afternoon, so extra high five for Jeff for getting up at eight to get this interview up and running. That's uh, okay. I've been up since six o'clock. So for the people that are unaware, what is Bud Buddies and uh, what led to its creation in 2002? Um, back in 2000, uh, I was approached by a friend of mine who, uh, ever since I've known her, she'd uh, suffered from MS. Um, and then I saw her one day, and she, to be honest, she looked terrible. And she admitted that she'd had no cannabis for a month. Uh, the reason being um, that the dealer she used to get it from had gone to prison. Uh, she had to find a new dealer. She ended up going going around pubs on the, up and down the dock road in Liverpool trying to score weed. Uh, ended up in a car park. She's there in a wheelchair in the car park, and... Someone pulls a knife on her and um, steals her purse. Uh, so she didn't get her medicine, didn't get her weed. She got robbed. She didn't even report it to the police because she was scared that she would get in trouble because she was doing something as she put it illegal. So I thought, well, it's only a plant. How hard can it be to grow? So I started growing it. And that led to the creation of Bug Buddies because... She was also involved with the MS Society. So when she got a good source of uh, cannabis um, and it was helping her, she was telling her friends. Um, and within a year, uh, her and myself were, were supplying 20 of her friends in the MS Society with cannabis. So that, that, that was sort of the creation of the buddies. And um, we realized that very early stage is the demand was always going to be there and what we had to do to empower people was to teach them and empower them with our knowledge so that they can grow their own cannabis become self-sufficient and uh, take it in whatever form they require so that was the creation of our buddies and that's been our founding philosophy and that's what we've stuck to ever, ever since is empowering people with the knowledge to be self-sufficient so i take it in that's I'm just on a joint, by the way sorry no, that's okay. That's no worries. I'll wait till after. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's uh, essentially, is that where um, Beggar's Belief comes in? They just have to have a, a, an establishment where it could be a central hub for people to get a hold of you, essentially? Yeah, well, um, again, back in, you know, start of the century, um, I heard about this guy in uh, Stockport in Manchester, a man, uh, Colin Davis, who uh, opened a cannabis cafe. And I thought, okay, it's interesting. Um, I went along to find out what was going on. And yeah, this guy had opened a cannabis cafe, cafe and he was openly uh, uh, deny, uh, defying the law. Um, I couldn't see him at the time because he was in custody um, for defying that law. But it was pretty obvious to me that um, uh, here was a guy who was challenging this unjust law. And... The more people did that, the sooner prohibition would end. So I, I was inspired by Colin Davis, uh, went back to North Wales and opened uh, the first uh, cannabis cafe in Wales. But I did it slightly different to the way Colin did it in uh, Man Manchester, was because instead of having an open 
coffee shop similar to Amsterdam, which is uh, what Colin had done in um, uh, Stockport, uh, I created mm -hmm. a private members club. So uh, at 45 and 47 Water Street in Rill, we had the Beggars Believe coffee shop, uh, which was open to the members of the public. And then next door, uh, we had a private members club which was uh, the first um, private uh, cannabis um, club in the UK. And I based that on um, the association model in Spain. And yeah, we, we operated there for five years. Um, many police raids, a few Crown Court trials. And yeah. Um, well, I take it so in, it was at 2014 that um, your research really took off when you moved to Spain? Yes. Um, after um, after my second Crown Court trial, uh, I was approached by uh, Denbysh County Council, and he wanted to buy uh, my property off me. Um, they just wanted me out of real. I've been there five years, openly defying the law, and they made me a ridiculous offer. They they offered me four times the market value of that property. Um, Was that just to get you out? Pretty much, yeah. And at the time, I was thinking I wanted to go and uh, live in Spain. Um, I have had a property um, in southern Spain, so I was going to retire there. And yeah, fitted in quite well. So um, I, I phoned up this listener and said that their offer was ridiculous and I wasn't accepting it, but I'd accept double their ridiculous offer. <laughs> and that's what they did. They, they doubled their ridiculous offer. Um, and because I'd moved to Spain um, before the transaction went through, and it was a capital gain because it was a business and various accounting things, I didn't even have to pay any capital gains tax on it. So um, it was tax free from Denver County Council, which, you know, I thank you for. Um, and yeah, it was my intention to carry on research in Spain. Uh, and I did that for a few years. Uh, and finished writing the Medical Cannabis Guidebook, uh, which is available on Amazon or eBay. Uh, Cannabis Cultivator wrote that book as well. And again, going back to the founding principle of Bud Buddies, which was to empower people, to give them the knowledge so that they could uh, be self sufficient. Because if you it was apparent to me from my friend's experience back in 2000s was that even if you've got a reliable source of good quality uh, medicine, um, and this is, what we're, this is what we're talking about for a lot of people, it, it is medicine, that source is not reliable because as my friend found out, you know, for two years, she was great until her supplier her pharmacist went to prison. Um, once you've got the knowledge and you're self-sufficient, there's no cause in the land that can take that information away from you. Yeah. When you know how to cultivate cannabis and you know how to make an extraction and take it in a form to suit your um, personal physical conditions or mental, and mental conditions, then no one can take that knowledge away from you. So of the thousands and thousands of strains, you can find out which strain improves your lifestyle. Here in Jamaica, we have a completely legal system. We've had a legal system out here now for five years. So we have licensed pharmacies, dispensaries, and yes, you can go along and it's that that would be a whole new interview, I would suggest. I don't know about research after you'd mentioned that. Um, I found yeah. it quite interesting that um, and it was in 2015, they created a regulatory body, the Cannabis Licence Authority. The thing that I found quite interesting about it in particular was it's actually coming from a government, the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Fisheries. So is it through a government-backed initiative that, that, and is it predominantly government um, overlooking the situation or is there, is there a lot of corporate influence that's going on as well? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer to all your questions, though. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. What What we've done here in Jamaica is, um, I mean, 
the, the prohibition of cannabis um, in, one, in whatever shape or form is a problem throughout the world. Uh, and that's due to the UN conventions. So well, basically you've got 200 plus countries in, in the world who've all signed UN conventions agreeing that um, they should all have a misuse of drugs act basically. Some countries call it a dangerous drugs act, some call it a misuse of drugs act. But for example, in the UK, if you're caught facing cannabis, supplying cannabis and possession of cannabis, you'll be in breach of misuse of drugs act 1971. If you are caught, for example, in possession of cannabis in Douglas in the Isle of Man, you're not in breach of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 because that's not applicable in the Isle of Man. In the Isle of Man, you'd be breaking the 1976 Manx Misuse of Drugs Act. So something else I've been saying for 20 years is be a legal expert on every law that you break and where you break it. Because some of the things I've done in North Wales, which has annoyed magistrates, would have got my head chopped off in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So when we're talking, you know, activism here, let's, let's keep things in perspective. So what's the what's happening cannabis-wise up in Scotland then? Very little, to be honest. Um, the, the same thing regard like cannabis-wise in Scotland is still it's still stuck on the. Westminster drug approach really is still trapped in that legislative circumstance of all the drug related instances that are you know, responsible for Westminster essentially. Medicinal wise, it's still relatively few people are able to get it. There's a, there's a, a clinic opening up in uh, Aberdeen, which is obviously a corporate owned Sapphire Clinic. So it's just private consultants that are only passing it over for the GPs. GP, NHS GPs are, are handing it over to this private consultation. So. It's a bit of an it's a bit of a nightmare to be honest. We're dealing with it seems evident there's a there's a grown monopoly um, that's that's corporate based, and it. it seems I, I mean most people attach it they would think it's conspiracy sounding, but it seems painfully obvious that they're trying to slow down um, the the move to national health service for medicinal in particular, just so they can fit in these clinics in a space, you know, so they can directly profit. It certainly seems what it seems like to me anyway, um, and I'm sure numerous other people as well. Um, but I mean, what the last time you were over here is it the same instance when you were last over? Um, yeah, and I can't see any, I can't see anything changing in the UK. Um, certainly not for the next five years with the Tory government. Uh, I think they're going to be very, very interested in the corporate model. And from what I can tell in the UK, um, same old, same old. If you're if you're wealthy enough, you can drive your car. Have a prescription for an ounce of bud a month drive around smoking it if you've got the right paperwork and you're not no danger yeah. I mean, anyone else what? I mean they could even especially if they're growing their own they could risk you know being kicked out by their landlord um, and as a few people are going through at the moment um, it's not just that it's not just a conviction for cannabis in one uh, way, shape or form. It's then the follow on, especially if you've been uh, cultivating or, make, or making your own oil and guilty of charge of production, you could then be uh, prosecuted under, under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Um, potentially then you can lose your house, car and everything you've ever worked for in your life. Yeah, uh, it's definitely... It's definitely long long. It's, it's definitely a mess. Um, the, only, the only small light it seems is that I think last year there was two or three uh, police uh, head, heads of police that had turned around and said that they weren't going to actively prosecute individuals that um, are growing small quantities of cannabis. However, in this small coronavirus um, time space, they seem to be doing just that. That They're, they're pursuing people um, that are just small, growing small quantities for medicinal purposes. Um, there's an individual that was on Facebook recently um, who'd had, uh, I think it was like three or four plants taken from him and he was using it. He was documented as having arthritis and yet they're still, you know, they're not listening. Um, most likely they're trying to just, I don't know, make up the monthly quarterly, something like that, probably. Um, yeah, we'll still have, because there is, crime is low at the moment, but so that it seems like they're just chasing it, you know, it seems like that's what's going on. Yeah, and it's, um, it, it is literally a, you know, postcode lottery. There are 43 um, separate police, for, police forces um, in the UK, and 
their cannabis policy is whatever their chief constable decides it should be. Uh, I, I've got total respect for the chief constable of the Isle of Man. He's actually putting this dilemma out there. He said 10% of um, the man's budget is basically spent on uh, the prohibition of cannabis. And does he want, or do the taxpayers and the people who live in live on the Isle of Man, is that what they want 10% of their budget um, spent on? And that started a debate which led to a referendum on the Isle of Man. There's 88, I think there's 88,000 uh, the population of the Isle of Man. They have their own um, uh, Misuse of Drugs Act. Interestingly, in the Isle of Man, responsibility for licensing under their Misuse of Drugs Act uh, is down to the Department of Health and not the Home Office as it is in the UK. So it's the same legislation, basically. Uh, same section, same offences. It's just this licensing in the Isle of Man is dealt with by the Department of Health. Um, and in England and Wales, it's, um, and Scotland, it's Home Office. That seems like a, a straightforward. A lot of difference because um, it's no easier to get it in the Isle of Man than it is to uh, uh, get it in the UK. But in the Isle of Man, 92% um, of the uh, public who responded to this referendum uh, said that they wanted access to cannabis. So that, that's what the uh, Manx government is uh, discussing. And I've been talking to various members of the Manx government. And I'm suggesting that they should follow, or at least consider, following the Jamaican model. Here in Jamaica, Jamaica formed the CLA, the Cannabis Licensing Authority, and they are responsible for issuing licenses and enforcing uh, the conditions of licenses. So there are licenses covering everything from cultivation to transportation and dispensing it and processing it. And it's a very, very good system that works well here. And they went a step further in here in uh, Jamaica, which, as well as bringing in uh, the licensing, so that you can go along to the dispensary and you can, uh, similar, sim similar to Amsterdam, there'll be a menu, you can select what you want, you can have an extract, oil, dabs, uh, sublingual preparation for um, administration of the tongue, sprays, or you can just get bud. And the bud you can inhale, you can take home, make into butter if you want, um, or you can smoke it in joints, and you can smoke it out in the dispensary. And here in the grill, we've got some very nice dispensaries, uh, have their own bars, so you can go, sit by the beach, have a joint, go in the pool, have a pizza, a few red stripes, and go home. Is that medicinal or is that recreational? No, that's just... I imagine, unless you feel you feel pretty pretty good after uh, a few hours um, at a cannabis dispensary, which is also a wellness spa. And if if any of your viewers are interested, next week uh, I'm going to uh, Doc's place, which is a dispensary here in the Grill, and uh, they're a wellness spa. And they're not just a, a cannabis dispensary, they're also, they're also about um, educating people, informing people uh, as well. And you can get, uh, for example, um, a herbal massage there with um, uh, cannabis oils. Uh, you can go in the seawater pool. You can go to the dispensary, have a joint, and have a red stripe with it. And I'm quite happy to... Uh, if you want to do another interview, we'll do it there next week. Definitely, that'd be fantastic. That'd be a great idea, Jeff. The, 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 it's been the past five years that this has been in place. Was this kind of a, a already present circumstance that just became official, or was this like really hard pushed by the locals? I mean, what was it that eventually snapped the changeover for the Jamaican government? Um, I, I don't know. I don't. It's very hard to put it down to one um, specific uh, event, but I would say it was payoff for 
for the people here in Jamaica who've been campaigning and fighting prohibition for all the years it's been enforced. And let's not forget, here in Jamaica and in the UK, in fact, worldwide, and even today, people have lost their lives and are still losing their lives to the prohibition campus. It's not ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I, wonder, I mean, that's one of the I things. Think, so. Yeah, I mean, here in Jamaica, you know, um, young Rasta uh, stopped by the police six, seven years ago. If he ran away because he had a joint in his pocket, he'd be shot in the back. No one's getting shot over a joint anymore here in Jamaica, and that's definitely a good thing. But they went further here in Jamaica, as well as bringing in this legal system, they also um, decriminalized um, cultivation for your own use. So each household here in Jamaica is permitted to grow uh, up to five cannabis plants, and also out in public, uh, you can carry up to two ounces on you, and that is deemed as personal supply. Uh, and there's separate uh, regulations for religious use as well. So Rastafari, Rastafari um, are not subject to the CLA. They have an exemption, um, which is administered by the Department of Justice here in Jamaica. And it's... It's a better system in the UK, put it that way. Cool. Um, it is annoying when you when you listen to you, what you're describing as well, with different regions of the world that are clearly so advanced in comparison to the UK. You know, we're still trying to push through this situation of still proclaiming the medicinal value. I mean, I spoke about it in an interview the other day with uh, the Scottish Cannabis Oil Assistance Programme, that CBD has been relatively accepted, you know, on the BBC, and, the, and they still mention it, but you're still dealing with that situation where they're holding on to THC. Like, you've got people that are talking about that, oh, yeah, I've got full CBD, there is no THC, when the reality is THC is unbelievably medicinal and therapeutic, you know, so once we get past that hurdle, I think, which I don't know how long, I mean, it's, it's, it's deflating, if I'm being perfectly honest. Well, it seems apparent in the UK there are people who are making uh, money from the prohibition of cannabis. You know, they, they always have done. Um, legal profession, especially at the moment. But as most of your viewers will know, the UK is the world's largest producer of uh, medicinal cannabis and exporter of it. Yet, it's still uh, locking up people and prosecuting them um, if they're cultivating their own or if they're not paying seven to nine hundred pounds an ounce to get it on private prescription from a private clinic and that's ridiculous i mean come on how how can that be justified yeah i can't exactly that i mean i think there's a there's a lady and i think it was east cobride who is continuously month by month campaigning um, and, and putting up GoFundMe pages and stuff like that so her son can get the medicines eight, nine hundred pounds a month each month. And the thing is, I think again, we're, we're dealing with this this hurdle of a uh, past medicinally in 2018, not really because of the amount of uh, symptoms, the amount of uh, conditions that can be applicable for is barely a handful. And not only that, her, um, I think her, her child does, he is applicable, I think epilepsy, I think is a condition, but the region she lives in, um, aren't permitting it through whatever circumstance, you know. So it's like this continuous hurdle block every single step of the way. Um, and I think I can't change see it changing within the foreseeable future. I'm really hoping that um, the, the corona situation is going to, because of the, the dent in the economy, it may cause a, an instigation of perhaps a, a re-evaluation of how cannabis will be applied. Um, whether or not that will happen or not, I'm sure it will be largely dependent on if the government will receive any form of... Um, increased tax revenue, et cetera, or the rest, the usual circumstances that are required. Um, but we should just really, time will tell, you know. I, I really appreciate, and I applaud your optimism. But <laughs> when, you, when you refer to the government, you are talking to this Tory government. Now, don't forget, the last Tory government, they, the people at the top there, they, prof, they, they profited very well. Uh, prohibition uh, during the last um, during the during their last, shall we say, tenancy of the of, of Westminster. Um, Theresa May, I'm sure that you've uh, reported on it. 
Yeah. And strong connection to take. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So you know, are these the people that you're hoping that are all yeah. in the future to have an epiphany and think, shit, what we've done is wrong? Okay. No, not at all. I'm, I'm really hoping it's the the basis of a, a dent to the economy. Hopefully, but we'll wait and see. Um, that's, we'll certainly wait and see that. Well, but again, from a Tory point of view, a dent to the economy. Well, it's a dent to the taxpayer because yeah. taxpayers going to have to have it all out. But we're talking about you know when I talk about the taxpayer, we're talking about um, chairman of British Sugar married to. Certain government stuff. I mean, come on. Haven't they just sold their? Haven't um, they just sold their forty-five acres of um, greenhouses for six, six million? You know, I read recently. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, if you can afford a private prescription, you've got nothing to worry about. If you can't afford it. You start to pay for the misuse of drugs act and go into court and all the all, all things associated associated with it. Um, so it's not a health issue in the UK at the moment, as far as I see it. it, it, it it's a wealth issue. If you can afford it, great, you can do it. It 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 should be fine. If you're a single mum and you can't afford a private street, uh, uh, prescription, and you have to, you know. Go from as well as the added additional worry of moving your child to a serious illness. No parent should have the added risk of um, losing the social services and the police being involved. And I've never met a police officer, to be honest, who 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 who's happy interviewing a parent who's been administering cannabis illegally to their seriously or turn the other child that's not what they go to these days yeah yeah no i mean it's uh it, 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 it's thing, again it's thing with good buddies um um i think it's on the Bud buddies uh, youtube channel is the episode of um the tile files where i, I carry my pal to meet a police officer who good buddies is supplying cannabis oil to for her cancer um suffering son so I'm getting arrested by her colleagues for breaking the very law that's keeping her son alive. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the hypocrisy we're dealing with. I mentioned that in the last interview, actually, that that is often the situation that you're dealing with these police officers that use back channels to, to get the exact medicine that they are like clamping down on. It's extremely immoral and unethical, um, but it's that hard position that they're put in. Um, but at the same time, it's it's just it's just a mess, really. It's, it is a mess. It, that perfectly takes back to the thing you'd mentioned about your book. Um, self-sustainability is key um, because it's not just the dealers and the, and the inability to get the medicine. Um, it's just the general um, just the general corner that people are stuck in. One of the things as well about the, your medical cannabis book is that you, you've said in the past, um, past interviews, that um, when people say it's like, oh, is that a treat, is that a, a, a cure? And obviously you've, you've you openly said often that you don't like calling it a cure, you like calling it a treatment because a cure implies it's going to remove every instance of a disease or a carcinogenic situation. Um, it must be quite frustrating for you, in particular relating to your 2014 uh, document Project Storm, I think it's Project Storm, that uh, it highlights, uh, you know, pertinently the, the efficiency of what cannabinoid medicine is. You know, you've got people that had um, very late stages of cancer and tumor situations that go into remission and that are, you know, com completely cured of that situation. And yet we're still in a cautious circumstance where you have to kind of trepidatiously say, oh, it's a treatment, whereas everybody can see firsthand that although not everybody will be cured immediately from the situation, there's a large portion that, that have a huge um, impact when it comes to cancer in particular. Um, and yet it's still not registered through these bullshit organizations such as the NICE and all these different things. You know, it must be extremely frustrating to you for, to see this over the course of years and we're still in this drudgery. Just saying, I, I actually came out one to get decent internet because up at my place where we were earlier, um, every time there's a lightning strike, the internet went off for 10 minutes and then it took 20 minutes to reset. So hence I've come down into Negril. So I'm now, I'm now at uh, Patsy's Coffee Shop where I've got a uh, decent flat white Blue Mountain coffee. They even do a ganja ice cream here. Jesus, a ganja ice cream, that sounds delicious. And I apologise for the um, sound of the sea in the, uh, in the background, but I hope it's okay. Not at all, very tranquil. You can hear the laughing in the background, so that's good.
Um, uh, as the girl serving the ice cream. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to go back to the last question there, uh, Jeff, before we broke off, um, when you said about the fact that obviously you commonly say that it's a treatment instead of a cure, there must be a slight amount of frustration in you when you see that it does have um, curative properties with people um, across the board often. Um, some people say I'm being a bit pedantic with the use of language, but um, I don't think cannabis actually cures anything. I think it's a more accurate to describe as a treatment, very effective treatment, but it's pretty obvious um, that, yes, cannabis definitely has medicinal benefits. And as human beings, we have an endocannabinoid system, which is a very efficient engine, apparently, which is main purpose is to achieve homeostasis in our bodies. And it's very efficient, apparently, at doing that. But, like any engine, if it hasn't got the right fuel, it doesn't matter how good it is, it ain't going to run. So, um, to feed our endocannabinoid system, uh, cannabinoids should be part of our daily diet anyway. So, I'm not, I don't find this whole recreational argument, blah, blah, blah. It, we need cannabinoids. We can choose which cannabinoids we want to intake, we can even choose some cannabinoids which will have a psychological effect or um, a sedative effect or maybe an anti-inflammatory effect. But surely that should be up to us. I should be able to decide who has dominion or control over what goes into my body, for God's sake. Yeah. So I should be able to choose which cannabinoids I can put into my body. And I shouldn't have to decide um, by the government. So it, it comes down to me to the use of language. So. Cannabis can be a very effective treatment for cancer. Even people who've got no other chance, people who've been given days to live have resorted to cannabis oil and made a miraculous recovery. Well, it's not miraculous. It's treating it with a very efficient and effective medication. But... What is apparent with people who've been successful in sending their cancers into remission is that they require um, what's re referred to as a maintenance dose to stop it returning. So, again, coming back to the pedantic use of language, if, if, if cannabis oil was a cure, people would take cannabis oil, the cancer going to remission, they would be cured and it would not return. That is a cure. But if they're being advised and the evidence is there that they have to take a maintenance dose to stop the cancer returning, well, isn't it more accurate to describe as a treatment? I just think um, using the word cure, um, it, it gives people a false impression in, the, in, in their heads that, oh, I'm going to take 60 grams of cannabis oil because I saw Rick Simpson on YouTube and I'll be cured. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Um, some people might never go into remission. It certainly has an impact um, on cancer and s serious illnesses, but this is why Bud Buddies is about empowering people to give them the knowledge and the information so they can make an informed des decision of what they want to uh, use to treat their illness. And if they decide that they want to use cannabinoids, fine. If they decide that they want to grow their own ca cannabinoids or make their own preparations, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't particularly have a problem with that. I don't really see why the legal system should either. But for me, I see a danger in the UK. And um, I, I watched the video um, when I was coming down in the car here just now. Uh, Mike Barnes being interviewed, talking about uh, the private clinics. And yeah, that's great. And Mike's quite right in what he says. But there does seem to be an people trying to create an impression now that medicinal cannabis if you get it from the likes of Mike Barnes and his private clinics, if you can afford two, three hundred pounds for a private consultation and then nine hundred pounds for an ounce, because at that price, you can drive your car and you can keep your job, keep your house, etc. But if you don't want to pay Mike Barnes to be your dealer and you want to grow your own, 
well, you've got a problem. No, I, f- I fully agree, Jeff. I mean, one of the things as well, it's, it's pretty evident when you, the way you're describing it, is that there does seem to be an implied ignorance on individuals who think, well, they, they can, we'll have to take it out of the hands of people because they'll, they'll imply that there's a lot of people that don't know anything about cannabis and yet if they need to use it, all of a sudden they'll go into this dark water where there'll be no information, there'll be no need, um, there'll, there'll be no ability to grow efficient medicine, therefore, we have to apply this instance of consultations and, and um, availability of, of extremely expensive advice. When the reality is the internet has opened up a huge uh, um, network of information that's available. I mean, this conversation right now will likely influence a lot of people that have no knowledge of what cannabis is at all. You know, they'll, because they'll, to be perfectly honest, until I started doing research for my book um, and the channel and stuff like that, I was unaware of Bud Buddies as well, if I'm being perfectly honest. And, and Bud Buddies is a huge situation. You would never hear about that in the media of, of organizations openly uh, giving out medicine to people that required it, you know, um, free of charge, non-profit enterprise, because this would undermine um, the, the narrative that the BBC often present. Um, and I think this is what we're dealing with a lot of the time is just that, they, that there is an implied ignorance across the public given by the mainstream media that they don't know what they're talking about. And that the legitimacy is they're actually more informed. I mean, think of any um, individuals consuming cannabis from the 70s and 80s, um, you know, and through that have been aware of these properties. You know, I mean, they've got it on record used for epilepsy 200 years ago. Um, you know, Queen Victoria used it for our, our menstrual cycles and all the rest of the, the, the attached to these lists. And yet we're still in this ag- ignorant perspective, you know, of like, yeah, all right, well, we don't, we're just now finding out about it when it's not the case at all. Um, yeah. It, again, just taking a step back from what we were talking about earlier, um, the prohibition of cannabis. The Home Office have been referring since the 70s about the war on drugs. Now, if you think about it, if a government and the UK government, the Home Office here, are talking about the war on drugs. They've declared war on drugs. Yeah. Okay, so according to the Home Office, what's the problem with drugs? Drug users. So the UK government has declared war on some of its own citizens, i.e. ones who are, who are consuming certain drugs without a license. So. As I said earlier, if you've got a prescription from Mike Barnes, you're bulletproof. But if you can't afford a prescription from Mike Barnes, well, you're a drug user. And the UK government has declared war on you. So you're in a civil war. Now, what do you do if someone declares war on you? You surrender or you declare war back. And that's what me and my buddies did. And a couple of years ago when... um, Paul Flynn, may he rest in peace, what a great MP he was, when he asked people in the UK to come to Parliament the 23rd of February 2018, deliberately break the law with cannabis and see what happens, challenge the law. I answered that call and I got arrested and I pleaded not guilty. And I gave an interview, I was charged, and a long story short, a year later, um, I was summoned to Magistrates Court. Uh, the police didn't tell me I was due at Magistrates Court, so in my absence, a warrant was issued for my arrest. So when I heard there was a warrant out for me, I handed myself in. I was arrested by North Wales Police, transported down to uh, Southwark um, Magistrates Court, uh, explained that I hadn't turned up at their court to answer the charges because I didn't know. The police hadn't told me. Um, Magistrates said, okay. Fine, as you plead, not guilty. I want to go to Crown Court. A month later, I turned up a Crown Court. Two minutes before my case was due to um, charge, uh, start, um, CPS dropped all charges. They didn't want to put me in front of a jury. Just going back to the law, um, I find the law fascinating, certainly in relation to um, cannabis, because Feed the Birds campaign. I don't know if you've heard of that up in Scotland. I think I've heard of it, but I'm unsure of what it is. Okay. Um, many years ago, sat in a police cell, awaiting to be interviewed. Um, I'm always thinking when I'm waiting to be interviewed under caution in a police cell. I'm going through a role play in my head of the questions that I'm going to be asked, the possible answers I can give what questions they will then generate. So I, I, run, I run through it in my head. Um, and the important thing for me is because every time I'm charged 
I'm going to take it to Crown Court. I'm facing, I'm facing up to 14 years in prison. That means I'm entitled basically to a, a Crown Court trial. I'm entitled to a jury. So I want my jury. But CPS don't want to put me in front of a jury. So I have to keep breaking the law until I don't have to do it anymore. And parents aren't contacting me because um, they contacted me as a last resort. They're contacting me, and if I refuse to help, if I refuse to help them, they're not going to give up. They're good, then they're going to end up contacting someone on the internet. It's going to rip them off. You're going to sell them fake oils or dangerously made oils. Um, whereas what we, as I said, what we try and do with our buddies is we will assist people who are terminally ill or uh, the parents of uh, surgically ill children, and we can supply them with cannabis oil until they are self-sufficient themselves. So, uh, because again, it became very conscious to me is that if I'm serving a five-year prison sentence, I can't help anyone in a prison cell. Yeah. But if I've given them, if I'm sat in a prison cell knowing that all the people I've helped are self-sufficient and growing their own, I'll do, I'll do my time. Yeah. I've got no problem doing my time if I know the people who I've been helping are helping themselves. And a lot, for a lot of people, what puts them off is fear, is fear of the unknown. And this is what struck me 20 years ago. It's like, all my life now, I've obeyed the law. And all of a sudden, shit, I'm going to be breaking the law after cultivation. Wow. For well, up to 14 years in prison, a drug dealer. But once you get over that and realize it's a plant, it can make an old person feel better or save the life of a dying child. Where's the fear? The only fear should be of the law. Yeah. My view is a law with no, which has no victim, and this is what struck me 20 years ago, of all the offences I've committed over the last 20 years, there are no victims of any of my crimes. Yeah. So if there's no victim, how can it be a crime? Exactly. I mean, even the, it's, uh, it's extremely frustrating to even call it a crime because the reality is, it's, it's the teach a man to fish situation, and it's not. And in, in the past, and even in the you know in the recent past, in the past week, I get referred to often. I think one of the comments on YouTube videos, you're clearly very passionate about what I talk about, and that's what they say. You're very passionate about cannabis. You're very passionate about it. And the answer I always give is like, it's difficult not to be passionate about something that's prohibited, um, told that it's bad for you and in the past, that makes you go insane, but it saves people's lives difficult to not be passionate about something that can change people's lives dramatically you know and, and I think the more and more um, people become aware of this instance in particular when we mentioned the endocannabinoid system the reality is we have cannabis to thank that we're even aware of that system you know the, the, the study in cannabis and its physiological reaction with the body and, and you know and, and its relationship to humans in general is the only reason why we're aware of the endocannabinoid system you know and it's, it was over the decades of slow painful research that was able to be scraped by due to the law that we're aware of this physiological system and now it's becoming aware. I mean, Emily um, like said in that other interview there that it's the master controller of, of all other uh, systems in the body, you know? So it's, it's we actually, instead of um, discriminating against this plant, the reality is it should really be celebrated as something that's, that's uh, a positive contribution towards well-being generally for humans. Totally, I totally agree. Um, and it's for me, it goes down to human rights. I should have the right to consume cannabis, but I also respect people's right not to consume cannabis. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, some police forces, again, as part of, when you look at the war on drugs and you start looking at it as a war, and the English, they're very good at war, you probably don't know this in Scotland, because you know you probably think English are all beneficial and you know, <laughs> or, 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 yeah, um, or something like that. But anyway, so English are very good at war. Um, the Welsh will testify to that. The Irish, especially, and even the Scottish, might have something to say through history on. You, you can't know, even might have to. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about it, you've got your own government in, there in Scotland. 
And they've got some sort of assembly stroke government. Let's try and keep everyone happy in Northern Ireland. Whereas the English shouldn't even fucking be in Ireland, but let's not go there. Then you've got the Isle of Man who's got their own like, little government who are now going to be doing their own thing. You've got Scotland, as I said, got their own government. Wales got their own assembly. But um, drugs, for example, is not a devolved issue. Health is. This is, this is the interesting thing in, in point of law, is um, it's like in the Isle of Man, where the Department of Health is responsible for their misuse of drugs are. In the UK, it's the uh, Home Office. Well, in the UK, um, drugs, cannabis, prohibition, all etc. It's not drugs are not a, a devolved issue. Yeah. If it was a health issue, yeah, Scotland could do what it wanted, but it can't because, um, according to the Home Office, only certain forms of cannabis now have medicinal benefit. Up until November 29, uh, 2019, cannabis had no medicinal value at all, according to the Home Office, single one drug. And then in November last year, that changed. All of a sudden, if you get a private prescription and cannabis on prescription from Mike Barnes because you can afford a thousand pound a month. By the way, this isn't Mike Barnes' fault, right? Mike's working within the system. Um, that as, as it is, it's the system that's wrong, not what Mike's doing. Um, so, when it, so when you look at everything that's going on in the UK politically at the moment, and I said with, with, with the war on drugs being a war on people, and the English very good at war, they're now trying to create this image in the, as, as I see it in um, the, the, the public mind, there's medicinal cannabis from Mike Barnes and private clinics is safe. That's medicinal cannabis. Cannabis is someone's growing at home. Well, that's, that's skunk. That's dangerous. Yeah. So, again, looking at it as a war on drugs, the first victim in any war is the enemy. You have to be <laughs> even around your enemy. So yeah. this is why the Home Office and the UK government refer to drug users. They're not people, they're drug users. And they, and they come up with these brilliant campaigns of rat on a rat. Mm. So again, in any in any war, you've got to report your enemy. So um, demonize that enemy, report them. If one of your neighbors in your street is growing weed, might be growing it for their own health, causing no harm, growing it even for their terminally ill child. But according to the government and their campaigns, that's not a person, that's a rat. Yeah. That's a drug user. You've got to report them. They're a danger to your kids and society. And um, so on one hand, you've got the government doing that. And on the other hand, you've got members of the government personally profiteering from the prohibition, um, their marriages. Um, no, you're completely right, Jeff. I mean, it's, 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 it's angering, to say the least, um, in particular when you hear of children and um, adults that are in a state of need. Um, but when you touched on that there about how the, um, there is a, a false narrative of individuals that grow their own um, are going to have no education based on it, so the quality that they're going to produce is going to be relatively low, um, and it could also be a danger to anybody that's also sharing or any that kind of thing. That's one of the things that annoys me often when it comes to this, because the reality is, you know, being a cannabis consumer, I've experienced um, commercial-based cannabis when you've got to get through back channels and et cetera. And the reality is you can tell that there is a, there's no care whatsoever going in. There's a mass production that's hoping. There's a mass production, essentially, which is, which is uh, the main aim for, for these criminal gangs that's all um, profit-based. So one of the things that I find um, sadly ironic is that when you're dealing with communities that are in control, that have recreational cannabis uh, clubs such as you set up, um, there is a greater control over product quality instead of uh, an absence or a decline in product quality. And this is one of the things where um, I think that's one of the reasons why they, I started the channel as well. And it might have sounded pretty basic when I'm describing what is Bud Buddies, et cetera, et cetera, because individuals that are part of the uh, cannabis community will be fully aware of this. However, we're dealing with people because of CBD in particular that are now stumbling across cannabis as, oh, I didn't know that about it. I mean, the amount of times that I hear that in a week, I didn't know that, I had no idea and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's frustrating, it's also slightly um, 
encouraging because it's a group of people that would ordinarily stigmatize that. So one of the things that I find um, is most likely a benefit is, like you said, self-sustainability. You know, self-sustainability is key. Educating everybody is key. And I think the more individuals that educate themselves and that they realize that we have been exposed to the greatest propaganda campaign in human history. You know, I mean, to, to be lied about this and this such an extensive still to this day, um, it's really mind boggling. And I think in particular, when you look across the world um, globally and you see how backwards the UK is, it makes it much more evident that we're dealing with not only um, an ignorance perspective, but a self-serving interest that's all about monopolization, gaining control. Um, UK's not backwards. UK's at the forefront. It's like the UK government will tell you uh, the UK is the largest worldwide producer of medicinal cannabis. So UK are backwards. No, you know what I mean? In, in, in the States of... Uh, I, I, know, I, know, I know exactly what you mean. 99% yeah. <laughs> of your viewers will know, ex well, exactly, will know what we mean. Yeah. Um, but again, it just goes back to this whole war on drugs thing, this whole propaganda thing. And part of the whole educational um, aspect for me is um, to educate the, the public, which is a little bit selfish in my view, but I know at some stage, because I'm not, because I can't stop breaking UK law. I'm going to get arrested again at some stage. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to insist on a Crown Court trial. Maybe this time the, C, uh, the CPS will want to put me in front of my jury, in which case I want 12 members of my jury to be as informed as they can on the facts of cannabis, because then they can to an informed decision. Um, I've always pleaded not guilty. I don't. I don't see how people can. I don't understand why people accept the caution. I understand why they plead guilty. It's a magistrate's court. Um, that's that's how prohibition works. Prohibition can only work if people comply with it, and that means by paying the fines of it. So if you are caught in possession of cannabis, then you might be offered um, a caution. So you'll have to admit that you've broken the law, that you were wrong in doing so, um, and pay £160. But if you pay within 14 days, I think they give you a discount, so it's 80 quid. But still a criminal record, you still have to admit you're, you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't do that, because it's the law that's wrong, not me. Yeah. So... I think, I think it was uh, that Thomas Jefferson or something like that. He's got a really good uh, quote that has something to do with the fact that um, it's uh, for, uh, for a good man, it's his right to um, disobey an unjustifiable law, something to that effect. Yeah. Um, wasn't, it, it was indeed. And again, it comes back to civil li liberties. And he was quite right that um, a citizen has a duty to obey the law but also has a duty to disobey an unjust law. And at the time, he was referring to slavery. Quite right. And it's the same here. It, this is the prohibition of cannabis. It is an unjust law. Certainly when you're talking about how can I respect the law that says that when a parent of a dying child says that me and my buddies are their child's last chance, will we help them? And the only thing that would stop us would be our fear of breaking the how can I respect such a law? I can't. So, weird thing with Bud Buddies is, Bud Buddies was formed 20 years ago through necessity. And one of our founding principles is that it's our biggest wish to close it down. Because if the UK had the same system for cannabis that we have here in Jamaica, I'd close for buddies tomorrow because there'd be no need for it. Mm. There wouldn't be any need for it at all. So, I mean, um, at this moment in time, but Bud Buddies, I mean, what are you, is it um, now resolved down to helping children and, and, and cancer patients due to restricted resources? Well, what we've had to do is um, over the last 10 years, we've had to focus more on um, um, priority. So, again, interesting legal point. Um, my first Crown Court trial at Chester uh, Crown Court, court number one, 
2004. I pleaded not guilty um, to possession and uh, possession of intent to supply uh, cannabis to uh, people who were ill. And I successfully used the defense of necessity, duress or circumstance. This is a defense in UK law, it's a common law defense, which basically says this in certain circumstances, it can be right to, it can be a defense to break a law to um, avoid a more serious events. So for example, we're here by the beach. If, if there was a child in the sea drowning, and there was, there was a car parked here, and on the passenger seat there was a life jacket, if I broke that window, that's a criminal act. But my defense would be, an act of necessity to avoid a greater a, a greater danger, uh, which is that child dying. Yeah. So, um, the judge permitted me to, to use that um, defence, and I was found not guilty. On my first Crown Court trial, I was found not guilty. Um, CPS weren't very happy with that at all, so they sent my uh, verdict to the Court of Appeal, saying that my judge. I'd made an error in law by permitting me to use that defence, and the uh, Court of Appeal in what's become known since as the Quail ruling um, ruled basically that uh, necessity, duress, of circumstances can only be can only be used as defence to avoid serious injury or death, not to avoid um, or alleviate pain or suffering. Now, what that said to me legally was, if someone contacts contacts me who's got MS, who wants me to provide them with the preparation to assist to assist with their medical condition, I have no defence in law. That's what the court of appeal have said. But if someone contacts me to treat their terminal cancer um, or their child's Dravet syndrome, um, then that is a serious injury or death. So me, me breaking the law, I'd be providing cannabis, and so I should be entitled to use that defense again of uh, the rest of circumstances. I'm quite happy to put this in a free trial argument mm -hmm. to a Crown Court judge to see if he agrees with me or agrees with the CPS who says, who will say that I should not be allowed to use the defense of necessity. Well, the CPS don't, don't seem to want to put me in front of a, um, jury um so other people should be demanding their right to a jury yeah. it's certainly a technique which should be applied now i mean that's that's um you know your your advice is, is probably going to be heard by many who are going to be writing a notebook like i'll keep this in mind everyone, for the future <laughs> everyone, everyone will, every sorry to interrupt but everyone will agree with this but what they're going to be thinking is um yeah great idea everyone should do that I can't do that because, and that's how prohibition works. Yeah, that is. We all realize it's unfair. We all we all understand that everyone should fight it. We understand why they fight it, but we can't because. Yeah, yeah. So it, it does take the small person to stand up, really. And if we all did it collectively, you know, if everybody that that um, consumes cannabis decided, you know what, I'm not going to take the fear because I'm aware as well of. of Numerous people that consume cannabis but have a fear of, oh, I better not cultivate my own in case, in case. And, and they're not thinking about vast farms of, of their a handful of plants. And, and I think sometimes it does, there's an element of frustration because even on their own doorstep, they're not willing to push past that courage. They know that it's an unjustifiable law. They know that these are, these are little small wins for each individual that would choose to grow. Um, but in particular, the ambiguity behind the language that you're describing in the UK in particular is it's almost like a purposeful technique because it's through the ambiguity that it seems to be that the, the victories are won, you know, such as this person's a, a, a patient of a consultation, therefore they're allowing their, their prescription. This person's a private user who's grown their own, therefore are a criminal. Um, and, and these numbers will be reflected through the, through the media. Um, I, I sincerely hope that over the, the, the coming, you know, I don't know, the coming months, coming years and that kind of thing, that people are going to be more aware, they're going to be more um, frustrated at the amount of knowledge. Because as soon as, as soon as when I'm informing people about the endocannabinoid system in particular, there is a sincere level of shock in their face. And they're like, what? This is what's happened? You know, this is what's going on? Um, you know, so I think the, the, the ignorance that's present has been purposeful because the, the information has been withheld. 
the ones I think I'm, I'm sincerely hoping anyway, you know, it goes back to that hopeful su- circumstance where it's like, I really hope that people with a greater education will be more defiant about their own personal use of cannabis. So we agree. And when people, we need more research um, into cannabis and cannabinoids and not just cannabis and cannabinoids, but also hemp and um, everything that goes along with it. We, we know all the arguments. Um, and they're all logical and they all make sense. And, but, you know, it's referred to as hippie shit. <laughs> so, uh, uh, oh yeah, wouldn't that be nice if we could all live in peace? Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? Why don't we? Yeah, um, but yeah, I'll, just, I'll probably have to call it there, Jeff, and we'll get the email Steve. This was oh, a late. Thank you very much, Jeff, for this. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll keep in touch, and now we're in touch on email as well. Um, yeah, keep in yeah. touch, Connor, and uh, nice to know you, man. Thanks to Jeff for giving me his time, and thanks to you for sticking around until the end of the video. I sincerely hope you enjoy the content. I'll see you next time.